Good morning. Whether you're here in the room or there at home, we welcome you today on this beautiful Sunday morning. Crisp air outside. I love spring. And we have a chance to glorify the God who made it all, who blessed us each morning with breath in our lungs and a beautiful world to live in, faces to see in our family today. And so let's uh, build each other up as we sing praise to his name.
strength becomes our own. You're making me like you, clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes. For you will have your bride, free of all her guilt, rid of all her shame, known by her true name. And it's why I sing your praise. Well, Ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, you will be praised, you will be praised.
Jesus saves. I just kind of want to bring everyone together real quick. Um, what a blessing it is to get together. Just to send praises up to God. What a blessing it is to share with one another, be with one another, and realize what God's done for us. God has completely given his life for us when he didn't have to. And he continues to love us when we mess up. Because I know in the past week I've definitely messed up and I've had my sins. But yet I can still come back to the cross this morning. I can lay it down. And I can praise God that he lifted me up and forgave me for what I've just done. Every single time. Because he still chases after me every single day. And he chases after you every single day. It's not just me. Old things have passed away, your love has stayed the same, your constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that we thought were dead, breathing in life your son to shine on darkest nights. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore.
morning. Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there. Thanks for worshiping with us today on this beautiful spring morning. Whether you're here with us in person or worshiping with us online, we want to take an opportunity to share in the Lord's Supper as we do each Lord's Day when we gather together. And I'm going to read um, from John 19, but before I do that, um, like Chris said, um, we frequently need to gather at the cross, to meet at the cross. And so I want to I want to put you there this morning, if you would, um, just think about being at the cross of Jesus and. In the crowd with you is Mary, Jesus' mother. And so, picture that in your mind. Um, as a mother, what is Mary experiencing as she sees her son suffering on the cross? And then, what would Jesus as he sees his mother there grieving for him, what would he be experiencing? What would that add to his um, already difficult task that he was enduring? So from John chapter 19, I'm going to read from the uh, New Living Translation this morning. Verse 25, 
It says, standing near the cross were Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And he said to this disciple, Here is your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his home. So here's Jesus on the cross, suffering a cruel death, bearing the weight of the sins of the human race. And even then, he considers his responsibility that he has in his uh, earthly family. He is honoring his mother, making sure that Mary, his mother, is cared for. So we believe that Mary's husband, Joseph, has, has passed away sometime before this. And so Jesus, as the oldest son, would have the family responsibility of caring for his mother. But Mary also had four other sons, half-brothers of Jesus. Certainly one of them could have cared for their mother. Yet Jesus chooses to place the care of his mother with John, his beloved friend and disciple. Clearly this was a demonstration of love and compassion for his mother at a time when he should have been consumed with his own suffering and everything that he was enduring. But there's another significant part of this story that we shouldn't overlook. Just the night before, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus had told his disciples, tonight you will all fall away on account of me. And then Jesus quoted Zechariah the prophet when he said, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And Matthew tells us that when Jesus was arrested, all the disciples deserted him and fled. But now at the cross, one has come back. John has found the courage to come back and accompany Jesus' mother and the other women to the cross. Eventually, all the disciples would come back after the resurrection and after the coming of the Holy Spirit, and then their faith would literally change the world. They would have the courage to even die for their faith. But for now, at this point in their spiritual journey, at the cross, only John is there. So why John? Well, here's what John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, and the one who obviously loved Jesus, here's what he wrote in 1 John 4. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. No fear in love. It was this love that compelled John to continue to follow Jesus in the face of death. The disciple Jesus loved, changed by the love of Jesus. And it was the love of Jesus, not only for John and for his mother, but for us, that put him on the cross. So this morning we remember with thankfulness that sacrificial love, that confident love, that perfect love 
of Jesus as we take part in the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for, for our mothers and for their love and the sacrifices that they make. We pray that you would give our mothers strength and encouragement in maintaining a Christian home. You have shown us the importance of families and especially the importance of our eternal spiritual family. We're thankful for your sacrificial love, love that, love that drives out fear, love that gives us confidence on the day of judgment, love that makes us part of your eternal family. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. If you have your prayer list, I have an update, an addition, and a reminder to share with you from that. The update that I'm going to give you, uh, Gloria, uh, and I don't know Gloria's last name, but it's uh, Jane and Omar Beatty's daughter who had a stroke, uh, lives in Florida. Um, she, uh, her husband's been there with her. They've asked her to move her, her left side of her body uh, to see if there's any uh, movement there, and there's nothing. So she's completely paralyzed on the left side. She's in rehab. Um, we don't know how much longer she'll be in the hospital. And so if you'd be praying for Gloria and her husband, 
and especially Jane and Omar, that's really hard for them uh, to see their daughter go through that. Um, so just be praying for that. Uh, God does work and people can improve through therapy and God can heal people. And so just uh, pray accordingly uh, for Gloria. Also, uh, <clears throat> Chris McCarthy is having surgery this Wednesday. At the end of the service, she's gonna come forward and ask some ladies to pray with her. So ladies, uh, at the end of the service, when she comes forward, if you just be prepared for that. Uh, also, the addition that I wanna make is uh, Chris's aunt, uh, Nancy. Uh, last name is spelled Z-W-E-I-G. I'm not gonna to try to pronounce that, but um, please pray for Chris's aunt as well. She uh, also had a stroke. She's going through rehab as well and um, just struggles with all the things that go along with that. So if you'd be praying for her, I know uh, Chris and her family would appreciate that very much. Let's uh, pray and then we'll look at our text today. God, we thank you for this day that we can be here and just for your presence in our lives. And we're reminded that you are always with us, even though we go through difficult times and face difficult things. And God, we just ask that you just be in each of these situations. And we know of others as well. Uh, Lord, we know that your presence uh, sometimes seems far away when we struggle, but that you are always there. And so just remind them of your presence. Just remind them of your care and your love. And may we continue just to lift them up and ask for you to work in their lives. God, as we look at our text today, I just pray that you would reveal truth to us and that your spirit would speak to all of us and your spirit would speak through me. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Happy Mother's Day to all our moms out there. And um, probably for most of us, our moms went through a lot with us. I mean, they, moms tend to care for us uh, in ways that dads don't seem to be able to. I don't know about you, but I can remember as a child, there were just moments where I needed to have my mom. It's not that my dad didn't care about me, wasn't there. Same with our kids. There are moments that our kids just needed their mom, not me. I, that didn't make me feel any less. I just knew Jill was more important at that point. So... Uh, but, I mean, think about all the things that our moms go through, all the things that they faced, and all the things that they teach us. I mean, my mom didn't work outside the home growing up because my mom had myself and my three brothers, and that was a full-time job by itself. I mean, let's be honest about that. I mean, there are several of us here, you know, myself, Scott, Kevin, Guy, Ting, a few others of us, we could confess for a long time things that we put our mothers through that they had to deal with because of us or that our brothers did that of course we probably had nothing to do with except hey mom look at what they're doing do you see that you know just to you know point that out so that mom would know of course and that's really our sole motivation in that but i mean think about all the stories that moms could tell we could probably have volumes of books written about all the things that moms have removed from children's noses, couldn't we? All the things they've just kind of shoved up there and put up there and, and got blown out from there or from their ears or wherever. I mean, there are just lots of things that kids try, aren't there? They could tell stories. Or what about all the funny things kids say? Again, moms, you've probably heard kids say all kinds of crazy things. Uh, and just do things that just were funny, made you laugh. Uh, maybe all the injuries that you've cared for. Some of you deserve like nurses degrees for all the kids that, you know, your kids and how you cared for them and helped them. Uh, all the homework that you've done. I imagine some of our moms have passed high school three or four times at least uh, with multiple uh, emphasis in their study. Um, but also the joy that they had as a parent. Moms, you alone probably know some of the joys that you experienced in being a parent that, you know, us as dads, we kind of catch some of that. And we see some of that in how you care for our children. Um, but we don't know the joy that you've had completely. And I wonder if there's things like that that just really surprise you about how much of a blessing it was to be a mom. I've got a lot of things up here in the communion table, and I haven't talked about it for a while. Again, these are things from my Aunt Marcia Kay, and I've got, um, Patty Murky asked me for a picture of her, and I, I've kind of looked some. I haven't found one yet. I know they're hidden somewhere in our house. 
but uh, I found in a little article in a magazine that was written after her funeral, and it kind of talks about her life and has a picture of her up here. And uh, my aunt went to Zimbabwe as a single woman, and uh, she never got married. She went there to go and work in the school in the Mashoko Mission. Uh, she worked as secretary, she worked as head of a printing company, she taught, she did all kinds of things. And I think when she went there, that's probably what she was thinking, that she would go and help and be a part of the work. But as she got to know the people there, as she spent time with them there, she started to realize how instrumental she could be in their lives in just helping them get through life. And so my aunt would start to take care of people and meet their needs. And in places like Zimbabwe, uh, we experienced this in Haiti and other places as well. Kids don't go to school unless someone buys them a uniform and pays for them to go. They just don't do that. And so I found out, not while my aunt was alive, because she never talked about it, but only at her funeral about all the kids that she helped go through school and just help them have food to eat for their family. And my aunt, even though she never had kids of her own, she became mom to a lot of people over in Zimbabwe. And then as she grow, grew older, she became grandmother to many more. And it was at her funeral that I was sitting there and a gentleman was next to me and he was from Zimbabwe. He had come over to the United States to study in medical school and to be trained as a doctor and then to go back to Zimbabwe to help the people there because he was passionate for his country and helping those that he loved. And he said, your aunt helped me go to school and I would not be sitting here today if it was not for her. And I wonder if that role that my aunt took on surprised her, that it wasn't something that she expected and in that she found great joy. Today in our text, we're gonna have a surprise. We've had a lot of things going on as we've been going through the book of Revelation, but something happens here in this text that does not seem to follow the pattern and, and really is kind of a surprise as we look at it. So we're going to look in Revelation 11. We're only going to look at a few verses at the end of that chapter. And so we're going to see about the surprise that God reveals as the seventh trumpet is sounded. So the first thing we see in the text is God reconciling the earth. To reconcile means to restore or bring back into harmony, to settle or resolve differences. Uh, that would be like uh, the Packers and Aaron Rodgers being able to work out something where he stays with the team. That's probably the best example of that right now, where there seems to be a fracture there so big, uh, at least according to some reports, that he's not going to come back and play for the Packers ever again, but somehow things would get worked out and he would be part of the team again. That's probably something, the way we could look at, look at what's going to be in the text right here in this next verse, that God is reconciling, always has been striving to reconcile people to rebuild the relationship that he had with them in the building and bring people back into harmony with himself. And so verse 15 is where we see this. It says, The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And so this seventh trumpet sounds, we've had six before this, loud voices, proclamations, kingdom of earth, kingdom of heaven, all reconciled, and God's going to reign. If those words sound familiar, it's because you might have heard those very words in Handel's uh, Hallelujah Chorus. This is the text where he pulls from to do that. If you're not familiar with the, what the Hallelujah Chorus or Handel's Messiah, what, which it is a part of, that composition, Handel wrote that to talk about, first of all, the coming of Christ and the prophecies about him and then his birth. And then there's all, uh, all about his ministry and his time here on earth and then his salvation through the cross. Uh, the Messiah portion of that, the Hallelujah Chorus that we hear so often, that's part of the second movement. That's actually the climax of the second movement. And then he goes on to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. And so Handel pulls that 
phrase, the, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And I can't tell you how many times I've sang this and never knew where it came from. I mean, we used to do this every year at college. And I could probably sing a good portion of it for you right now. Maybe it wouldn't be exactly the right part, and I'd probably travel all over the place. But my point is, I've probably sang that song, I don't know, 100 times, more. I never knew it came from Revelation. I always thought it, it was a prophecy, like Old Testament pointing towards Jesus. That made sense to me. I thought that's what it has to be because we always sing it at Christmas time. It always is part of that celebration. We would do a living Christmas tree at college and that would be the last song that we would sing because it's just such a glorious song that sings about his praises and his coming and, and all the things that he's going to do and his reign is forever and ever. And so when we think about that song and think about these verses, we have to recon recognize that God here in this text is striving to reconcile the earth and humanity back to himself in the coming of Jesus as a baby in the manger, but we also have to see that it's far more than that. It's being said here in Revelation in the scope of the end times and Jesus coming back the second time, not the first time. But our world, our culture, our nation, it doesn't look like it's very reconciled to God, does it? It's not in harmony with him. Something else unexpected going on in the text is this. We've had six trumpets sound, and when they've been sounded, things blow up. It's not happening here. It's not in this part of the text. It's worship and praise. And so we've, we've had all these plagues, all these things happen, the locusts, the horses, people dying, and yet this trumpet sounds, and this is where we go. We're going to worship. None of that destruction is here, but reconciliation definitely is. See, we look at Revelation and we read the text and we think, wow, this is all the things God's going to do and all the judgment he's going to bring and that's true, judgment is going to happen. God's end goal has never been judgment. God's end goal has never been condemnation. God's end goal has been to reconcile all of humanity with himself. And the question is, are people willing to do that? Are they willing to accept what he has done? Are they willing to choose that he has saved them? Are they willing to be brought back into harmony with him? It's why Jesus comes and dies on the cross to bring us back into relationship with God, to be reconciled to him. It's why Moses gives the law to point people back to God, why Abraham receives the covenant pro pro promises, why Elijah and Jeremiah and Isaiah and all those other prophets, as we read through them, we go, wow, I don't know, and know or understand all of this stuff. I don't comprehend it. It's all there to reconcile people back to him. It's why the apostles went out after Jesus ascended to take the gospel so that the world can be reconciled to God, talking about his death, burial, and resurrection, everything that's been done, and it's why we must keep on taking the gospel. It's why we can't wait and just sit back and say, well, maybe they'll accept it someday. It's why the message has to go to every person, every nation, every language, every people. You see, God's purpose from the moment sin entered into the world was reconciliation. In Genesis 3, when, where Adam and Eve sin in the Garden of Eden, you have the very first prophecy about Jesus there in the text. He's always been about reconciliation, the reconciliation of creation to himself. Then we see in the text that God rewards his people. If you remember back to Revelation chapter 6, there were the souls of those who had been slain, because of the word of God, they had maintained their testimony about him. We call them martyrs, people who have died for their faith. And so we see them when Jesus opens the fifth seal. And they ask, how long is it going to be, sovereign Lord? How long is it going to be until you come and you judge the people of the earth? How long is it going to be until you avenge our blood? And I think it's here at this point that question is starting to be answered. 
Look at verses 16 through 18. It says, And the twenty-four elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry. Your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead, for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. So here we have this group of elders. We've seen them before. They enter back into the story. They fall on their face. They're worshiping God. And they tell us it's time to judge the dead and do two things. To reward God's servants and destroy those destroying the earth. Let me say for clarification purposes, I don't think this is talking about the environment. I'm as much about taking care of the planet, taking care of the earth. I mean, I put out my recycle bin, but when I, when I go to the Boundary Waters Canoe area in Minnesota, the area that's just so pristine that we drink water out of the lakes, if I see someone else's garbage out there, I'm picking it up, I'm packing it out. No matter how big, small, heavy, light it is. And so I, I, I think we should care about the world that we live in. But that's not what the text is saying here. We can't draw that inference. I think this has to do all about the damage that's being done to the earth by sin. Romans 8 talks about this. It talks about creation being liberated from the, its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and the glory of the children of God. And creation's in a constant state of decay. It's been that way ever since the Garden of Eden. And only when there's a new heaven and new earth will that be resolved. But in these verses, as we read them, it's obvious that God is going to reward his people. And just as God has always been doing things to reconcile humanity to himself, I believe he's always wanted to reward humanity. And we'll see that happening in the coming chapters. Because Jesus didn't come to earth just to save some, only to reconcile some, only to take some to heaven. He came for everyone. The issue is not everybody accepts that. The issue is not everybody wants that. Jesus himself said, narrow is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and few people find it. Broad is the gate, and wide is the road that leads to, dest to destruction, and many people walk on that. He's always come to reward people. He wants us to be with him. And then in verse 17, I ran across a, a phrase that bothers me because I didn't know what to do with it. I struggled with it. Here it is. It says, you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the reason why I struggled with that is because I thought to myself, hasn't God always had the power? Isn't he sovereign? I mean, I think that, I believe that, I've preached that. Hasn't he always been reigning? I wondered why it's phrased that way. And maybe it's because of what we call free will. That is where everybody chooses whether or not they are going to follow Jesus. It's everyone's choice, no one's coerced, no one's forced into it. They choose whether or not they trust in the salvation, they choose whether or not they follow him, they choose whether or not they're going to live a life that serves God, that's pleasing to him, or they don't. It's one or the other. There's not a third road, there's not a third option, there's not some other thing out there that God hasn't shown us yet. It's either they follow or they don't. They accept salvation or they don't. That's why Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father. No one comes to God except through me. See, I wonder, has God allowed us to think that we have the power over our lives, that we have control over our lives, that we can be self-sufficient, and then given us the freedom to decide, am I going to surrender my life to this God? who bids me to do that, to call him Lord and Savior, 
to humble myself before him, even though I think in my mind I can do all the things that I need on this earth on my own. I wonder if he let us think that so that we would wrestle that with that decision as whether or not we could humble ourselves and accept him. The beauty of that is that's what he did for us. The beauty of that is that's what Jesus did when he came to the earth. You can read in Philippians 2, Jesus gave up everything. We see all the amazing things in Revelation. He gave up that. We're just like that over and over and over again. Creatures and elders and angels are just bowing down and worshiping and glorifying and saying, you're holy, you're awesome, you're perfect. And Jesus said, I'm going to set all that aside. I'm going to give all that up. I'm going to come to earth. I'm going to live as one of you, know what it's like to be you. And then in the end, I'm going to surrender my life and give it up for you on a cross so that you can be saved. Remember, right before Jesus was crucified, he said to the people who were arresting him, I could call down 12 legions of angels if I wanted to, and they would take care of me. We've read in Revelation what one angel can do, and it's amazing the power that one angel has. Jesus is saying, I have tens of thousands at my disposal if I want them. And yet, he doesn't do that. No one had power over him. He surrendered his life. He willingly did that, and he asked us to do the same in response to what he's done for us. Will we surrender our lives to him as he has surrendered his life for us? It's powerful. Paul puts it this way in Galatians 2.20. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And then he goes on to say this. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's why we sing about the beauty of the cross. That's why we worship Jesus as the Lamb who was slain. It's why the elders fall down and worship the one who sits on the throne and is Messiah, the Son Jesus. God will reward his people. And then we have verse 19 where God reveals his temple. I don't know about you, but growing up, one of the movies I really enjoyed was Raiders of the Lost Ark. And you can catch that from time to time on TV. It kind of shows up, and I see that, and I watch it. And I think how cool it is. It's fun. It's a very fun movie. Uh, and, and there's one thing that's true in the movie that I'd like to just say, and that is that the Ark was lost for a long period of time. When the Babylonians came in and they conquered Jerusalem and carried everything off from the temple, the ark was probably one of those things. I don't think they would have left it there. I think they took it away so they could gloat over it. We don't know what happened to it. So that in the movie is true. I don't think someone before World War II found it and got locked away and it's in some place over in Arizona locked away in some secure location. I don't think that happened. But we do know what happened to it. Look at the text. Verse 19, then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant, and there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. The temple is mentioned in Revelation in at least 13 different places. The ark of the covenant is mentioned one place, right here. I wonder if it's mentioned here at the sounding of the seventh trumpet, at the beginning of all the rest of the things taking place in the book, to encourage the readers of this letter who would read it. Remember, most of the Christians at that point who's going to read this are not Gentiles, they're not people that have no relationship with God before that. They're Jewish people who've recognized that Jesus is their Messiah and they accepted it. And so the Ark of the Covenant would have great significance to them. Maybe it shows up in the story to remind them that God is faithful, that he's not forgotten his covenant with Abraham or with Israel. Maybe it shows up to help them to see that the old covenant is connected to the new covenant, which Jesus instituted when he celebrated communion, the celebration of the, the shedding of his blood and the breaking of his body on the cross. And maybe it's to show them that even though they're facing persecution and death, they have hope. 
the ark was carried away before Jerusalem was destroyed. But if this is it, it's not lost. It ends up in a place I think no, none of them ever expected. And the hope that they have in God is not lost either. Maybe it's here to remind them that they will find mercy in God. The ark was a, was a table-like structure, a box, maybe similar to our communion table. I think probably a little smaller. But on each side, there were two angels, two cherubim right here. And there was a space right here that they would call the mercy seat. And the Israelites believed that when God came down and filled the temple, when he came to the, the, the place in the Holy of Holies, that that's where God was, on the mercy seat, in between the cherubim. Maybe it's a reminder to them that even though all the things that they're going through, that they can still receive mercy from God. That he still offers that to them. Maybe it's one of those, maybe it's all of those. Maybe it's other things I haven't thought about. I don't know, but when the temple's open, when the ark is revealed, creation celebrates. We see all these things happen. The earthquakes, the hailstorm, the lightning, the thunder. In the past, as we've read it, usually it's destroying something. Apparently, nothing gets destroyed at this point. I'd like to suggest to you that creation itself is celebrating the presence of God. I grew up in Kansas. I love thunderstorms, but you know what's true about them? In the middle of the night, when the lightning strike is about 50 feet away from you, and it sounds as if it's coming down on top of your head, and you can hear it coming, it's terrifying. But that doesn't mean I don't like to watch and be a part of it and just to enjoy what it is. I think that's what's happening here. Creation itself is celebrating what's happening in these verses. So what's our takeaway from these verses? I have thought to myself, you, you know, we have these pauses in Revelation from time to time. I've thought to myself, maybe this is another one of those pauses, one of these moments in the text where something happens that we don't expect. And I think that's true in the fact that the seventh trumpet is sound, sounded and nothing is destroyed at that point. We just have worship. We see God in his temple. But I have to remember that, uh, I have to remember that this is what happens uh, as the seventh trumpet is sounded, but the, the trumpet, we're told earlier in the text, is to bring about woe. We see that with the, the fifth trumpet. We see that with the sixth trumpet. They are sounded at the end of it says, this is, you know, this is the woe that comes from this trumpet. But I looked on in Revelation, I can't find the word woe that relates to this trumpet following this. And so I wonder, like that seventh seal where we either knew the least about it or the most about it, is what happens in the rest of the book, the revelation of what happens from the seventh trumpet. What's stated here in these verses, that judgment is coming, that the reward for his saints is coming, and that's what plays out in the rest of the book. And that should lead us to the point where we ask ourselves, have I surrendered my life to the one who gave up his life for me? Have I accepted the mercy offered not by the mercy seat on the ark, but by the one who sits on it. The one in whom is found mercy. Today there are some people who have planned to come forward uh, as we come to our invitation time to uh, be baptized, to be accepted, uh, to accept salvation, to be a part of God's family. And they're going to allow themselves to be buried into the water behind me, to plunge into that, to identify with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, to come out of the water claiming the promises of salvation, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the mercy and grace that is found in, only in the one who died for their sins, that is found in Jesus. Maybe you haven't made that decision yet. Today's a good day to do that. Maybe you're thinking, I need to know a lot to do that. I've been to Bible college, I have a paper on my wall that says I have a Bachelor of Biblical Literature. I've went to master's uh, classes. I have a, another paper on my wall that says I have a master's in spiritual formation. I study and learn a lot of stuff every week as I prepare to preach. I'm taught a lot of classes. I've been in the word of lot, but you know, one thing I've learned from all that 
there is so much more to know about God than I even have a clue is there. I have a lot to learn. But the best part about coming to faith in Jesus is he doesn't require that. Because it was 10 when, or so when I was baptized, when I accepted Jesus. I didn't know a whole lot then. I'd been to VBS. I'd been to Sunday school. I know far more now than I did then. But it wasn't about knowledge. It's about having a childlike faith that says, I trust that what you say in your word, what you promise me you will do, and I wonder if that's not why we have these four, five verses at the end of chapter 11 to remind us. It's not about all the fantastic things going on in the book of Revelation. It's about knowing Jesus and the grace that he gives. That's important most of all. The kingdom of his world, of this world, is going to be the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. And like the song we sang earlier, we will sing of his praises forever. And I can't imagine what that's like. So today, as we come to our time of invitation, have you accepted the grace that he offers? Have you placed your faith in him? If you haven't, I invite you to come forward as we stand and sing. be seated. I'm going to have Cody and Ayana. I practiced that a long time. I still needed help. I'm going to have you stand up here. Um, Cody and Ayana are relatives of Ting and Shirley, uh, niece and nephew, I believe. And um, as you guys know, their family, this has a special place for them being in, in this building with all the history of their family. And so they have come here today uh, to come and say they want to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, be baptized into him, and to do that here as a testimony of their faith in him today. So I'm going to ask both of you a question. I'm going to just do it at the same time. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, your Lord and Savior and best friend forever? Yes, I do. Awesome. So um, let's pray, and then we're going to make our way back. Uh, Ting's going to share some things uh, with us, and we'll prepare for baptism. So let's pray. God, I thank you for uh, just the decision that Cody and Ayana have made today, just um, coming forward to profess their faith in you. Lord, what an awesome step, what an awesome statement, and what a powerful testimony of faith they will make in a few minutes when they identify with you, Jesus, through your death, burial, and resurrection, and then be filled with the Holy Spirit as they're raised to live a new life, beginning here, and that will be experienced through all eternity. How awesome that is to to just be a part of that today. So Lord, I pray for both of them. I know that uh, we know that Satan will continue to tempt them, continue to try to lead them astray. I pray that uh, you will give them uh, their family to encourage them and friends to encourage them and your word and your Holy Spirit and all the tools that you give us to stay faithful, to walk that narrow road and to also be a testimony of what God has done in their lives. We thank you for their decision today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hello. Hi. Is this on okay? I'm just going to share with you who these uh, kids.
kids are. Uh, the big one on the end there, that's our big Indian, that's Cody. And uh, his dad is the little Indian, that's Guy. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's how he gets commanded. But, and, and then the little girl is um, Ayana. Uh, she's 25. Um, she's probably the prettiest of all the Welch kids. <laughs> of course, I'm in there too, so it's really close. <laughs> uh, and that's Coralie's oldest daughter. Coralie is Toby's oldest daughter. And she's, well, I won't say how old she is. <laughs> 42. And Ayana is 25, and she has two children, um, and they're really pretty. And um, I don't have any funny stories to tell about Ayana, except for the fact that when she was born, um, we were there that day, uh, actually that evening, and from that point on, uh, she was probably the hardest kid to handle up until a few years ago. Am I right, Coral? Yeah. <laughs> but she's a super kid. She's uh, reading her Bible on a regular basis. We're happy for that. And she called us uh, a little while ago and a month or so ago and said she'd like to be baptized. And uh, we were so excited about that. That was really neat. Um, and so she's been, she lives in uh, Columbus uh, next to Uncle Guy, and she lives near, near her mother because she don't dare get too far away from her mother, and she's real close there. And um, we're really happy for her, and um, especially for her decision today. Now let me tell you a little about Cody. <coughs> Even though Cody's the big Indian in our family, <coughs> and he's big, uh, he has a heart that's unbelievable. I'm just going to tell you one story about Cody. When his grandpa Sai passed away <coughs> about 12 years ago, and Guy was walking past the restroom, and Cody was in there talking, and uh, and he kept stayed in there for a little while, and he came out. Guy says, who in the world are you talking to? And he didn't even bat an eye. He said, Grandpa, what do you think? And that's how close he was to Grandpa. And all of us, we really appreciate him. Um, he's a hard worker. He's 18 years old. No, 19. Just turned 19 yesterday, right? And single, by the way, in case anyone's interested. Um, <laughs> And he took to heart what I told him when he was three years old. I said, no girls till you're 30. And he's, <laughs> he's pretty much sticking to that. So anyway, um, I'm going to read some scripture. And then, uh, are you going to speak, Jim? <laughs> okay, I'm just going to read from the Great Commission. It's, uh, anyway, that's who they are, if anybody was wondering. Oh, excuse me, Matthew 28, <coughs> 16. It's from the Great Commission. <coughs> then the 11 disciples went to Galilee and to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, and some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All the authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I'm surely, <coughs> and surely I am with you always, even to the end of age. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Ding, for sharing. I, I knew you would do a good job of explaining who is who, and I, I think it's important that we all get the connection there, and I know that you and Shirley have had a big part in 
these two young lives, and so I, I appreciate that. And I'm glad you shared the Great Commission, um, because you'll hear in that that baptism is an important part of it, as is obedience. And in a few minutes, we will all witness a beautiful act of obedience as Cody and Ayana are baptized and it's also a historic day in their lives as they're baptized and a new life in Christ begins. So let's pray and then uh, we'll, we'll witness this baptism. Father, we're, we are just so thankful for the decision that Cody has made the decision that Ayana has made today and for their willingness to be obedient to you through baptism. And we pray that their testimony might be an inspiration to others, especially those that are, that are contemplating this decision. And so we just pray that you'd help us as your, your body of believers, your eternal family, to uphold Cody and Ayanna in their Christian life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Following the baptism, we will sing the chorus of Jesus Paid It All. Okay, you can come on down. Just use the handrail. Cody, because of your confession and faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit for forgiveness of your sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Just hold on as you come up. lay your hand or grab right here like that right next to, and then lay your hand like that you'll hold your nose before you okay I know because you believe that Jesus is God's son and your Lord and Savior I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to, for forgiveness of your sins and to receive the Holy Spirit congratulations Oh. 
pray together. Thank you, Father, for your presence with us today through your Holy Spirit. As we leave here today, we just pray that your Spirit would go with us and uh, that you would continue to guide us and and change us. And we... uh, We pray that our words and our lives and others might be drawn into your family. We just ask this in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus. Amen. And thank you for worshiping with us. Come on up, Chris. And uh, if some of the ladies would like to come up and pray over Chris, you can do that right up in front here. And... Thank you again for worshiping with us today. Happy Mother's Day, everybody.